All right, guys, who was Jesus and is there reason to believe in him? Aaron Ra is joining me today on the show. If you don't know who he is, you will soon. Let me know if you guys have any guests that you're interested also in bringing to the table. Email me at mythvisionpodcast at gmail.com. I'll try and find these people, contact them and see if they're interested in doing an interview. Maybe they have books they could send me. I can get acquainted with their position and bring them on the show. Aaron Raw is going to take us into what I like to call a histomythicist position and also delve into other stuff in the Old Testament or Hebrew scriptures, showing a lot of interesting, strange things on how they believed. You guys don't want to miss this. I really enjoyed this show. The guy is scarier looking than he really is in person. He's actually a kind guy and a very he, he's very gentleman like i even tease him from the start so hope you guys like this don't forget to subscribe to the channel and let me know what you guys think by writing a comment down below peace we are myth vision Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Your host, Derek Lambert here. I've got an awesome show today from someone that uh, I guess you could say is a lot like me. He's just got a better voice when it comes to vocalizing the way he thinks and what he says on his shows. If you guys aren't familiar with Aaron Ra, and you need to go over there, just go down in the description, hit that subscribe button, make sure you guys get acquainted with his stuff because he deals with a lot of fundamentalists. But he's also an activist in many other ways, too. So it's not just religious stuff that he's dealing with, but he finds that religious stuff it weaves its way into society, into politics, et cetera, et cetera. So, Aaron, welcome to the show, brother. It's pronounced Aaron. Aaron. Yes, yes, sir. I'm sorry. That's all right. Everybody everybody gets it wrong. <laughs> you know, if you had a second A, I would just be like, A.A. A. Ron. <laughs> You remember that uh, the, the <laughs> show? The guy's like A.A. A. Ron. He mispronounces everybody's names. So yeah. welcome, man. Welcome. Oh, thank you much. I appreciate what you do. I really am a big fan of what you do. A lot of people look at you and they think you're a Satanist. What do you think of that? Uh, I, I often say that I, I that I, I can't be a Satanist only because, one, I'm I'm not young and, and sexy enough, and two, <laughs> I can't afford the wardrobe. <laughs> oh man. I mean I, those people those people got some style. <laughs> they really do. They really do. Um years ago when I was a fundamentalist, you actually were out on the scene still communicating these things. You've been out for quite some time and I saw you and my fundamentalist self couldn't stand you. I I did the same thing with Dr. Bob, uh Robert M. Price. I said this guy and he's debating um William Lane Craig, and I was like, Craig won, you know, like, yeah, and it's crazy how much one's mind can change when they actually start opening up their mind and stop being in a narrow box. I left the fundamentalist ideas, I started seeing parallels to paganism and other worldviews, and I said, at first, my deconstruction was God's bigger, you know, God's bigger than just Jesus, and then it was like, hold on, Jesus is in all these other... Well, it can't be just Jesus because he's predate him. And then I started saying, well, God's God's in all of it, right? Then I started deconstructing from there. It was a good gradual deconstruction. Some people have the aha and their whole life just crumbles. Um, I had a gradual deconstruction. So that was thanks to guys like you who pointed out obvious things and were not afraid to say what you think. I, I appreciate that. When you, when you said when you said thing about having an open mind, you know, I'm I'm in the same situation in that once I very strongly advocated for the truth with a capital T and my truth was still a lie. I mean, I thought it was truth because I thought it was something that I could demonstrate, but I couldn't demonstrate. I was, I was doing the neo-pagan spiritualism thing. I was doing like occult transcendentalism and I'm like, okay, now this is direct firsthand experience of the supernatural, right? Mm -hmm. But what it actually is, is direct firsthand experience of faith and faith is the most auto-deceptive, most dishonest position it is possible to have. If you if you believe things on faith, then you are lying to yourself. Uh, faith, the only thing in the universe that needs faith is is, is liars and bad salesmen. Um, the, <laughs> but you really can convince yourself to see and hear and experience virtually anything you already want to believe. It's just a matter of ambiance. And and that was the thing that actually broke me. The drum beat or or whatever, you know, I mean or or horror movie effects, whatever. 
I remember uh, in, in one case, there was this girl that was, that was doing uh, this kind of meditation. And I, I knew she's alone in this room doing this meditation. And I, I move a door open that opens very quietly. And I set a Buddha, a little Buddha down on the floor. And I know she doesn't know what the fuck a Buddha is. And, and so she, she thinks it's a demon. And, and she thinks she's evoked a demon. And I realized that, what? wow. I mean, all, all, all I had to do was put in like drums and incense or whatever. And like, oh. you, you're on. And, oh. and, and uh, just like, you know, see in your mind's eye. In other words, make shit up in your head. Right. right? That's what see in your mind's eye. Are. What does it mean when you look at somebody's aura, right? When you train yourself to look be just beyond what your eyes can see. What does that phrase mean? It means make shit up. And pretend to believe it. Lie to yourself. And I and sadly, sadly, my at the time when I realized that that I'm 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 actually lying to other people. I mean, I think I'm I'm bringing, the, but I, but but if I can if I can cause a Christian to see Jesus and I can cause a a, a Hindu to see Krishna, but I can't do the reverse. I right. can't cause. I can't make. If somebody was raised in India, I'm not going to make them see Jesus. That's that's just not going to happen, right? Guru Nanak, maybe, but but not 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 Jesus. Likewise, if someone's raised, raised in, in American Christianity, I am not going to be able to get them to see, you know, the the, the Hindu gods, any of them. Krishna, none of them. <laughs> yeah, so it, yeah, it's not like there's any one God. If, if there was one God that was true, damn thing goes off again. Every podcast. <laughs> it's okay. That's It's yeah, okay. Well, it, it saw a spirit walk by and it's like... <laughs> just teasing yeah yeah Yeah. no i agree with you i think um if what i was saying is if there was a truth to it if there was one god right an actual god if there was one right religion you wouldn't have hundreds of millions of people believing in a different religion Mm -hmm. and what's funny about that is that you know all the times that christians protestant christians whether they're baptists or pentecost or whatever the hell they all want to say that um that the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Catholics, they're not true Christians. The Catholics aren't Christians at all. Catholics are just Mary worshiping pagans. But if that were the case, Catholicism accounts for just more, just slightly over half of all the Christian collective. So, the, I mean, if Catholicism is not Christianity, then that would, and, and only the Protestant sects are, right? You, you, excluding Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses. But even if you include Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses still, if Catholics aren't Christian, then that means that Christianity is the fourth largest religion in the world. Islam is already the dominant religion on earth. And the second largest religion would be Hinduism, with 800 million people believing in that. So if, if popularity accounts for anything, what, what the fuck? And then the third largest religion would be Catholicism, and then Christianity. And then Sikhism. Yeah, because you'd have to separate Catholicism from the other Christianities, or and then you got to divide down from there. Um, well, no, no I'm, I'm talking about Christianity as a collective. If you right. put all of, if you put the the Baptists and the Pentecosts and the Lutherans and 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 even the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witnesses, put them all in one lump, right? right? And then they'll all say that Mormons aren't really Christian. They're just the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints. What the hell makes them not Christian, right? <laughs> you don't have to be Trinitarian to be Christian. Mormons are binitarian. There are also Unitarians. If you can accept that George Washington was a Unitarian, or the, maybe not Washington, but this, the early, the first five presidents, you know, you had a couple of, of deists in there that on their log books, they're listed as Unitarian Christians. And if you can accept that the founding fathers were Unitarians, then you can accept binitarians too. You don't have to be a Trinitarian. There's just a huge amount of hypocrisy there. Yeah. And that's why you have famously we had like last week we had that that woman who voted for Pete Buttigieg and then found out he was gay, and then <laughs> wanted to take her vote back, right? I don't know if you saw this. It was beautiful. So no, we, we I have, didn't. This this woman saying, "Well, I'm Christian and I can't vote for a gay man," and this other woman says, "Well, I'm Christian too and I work for this gay man who is also Christian." So and then they're both saying to each other that you don't believe. Wow. Uh, yeah, that's so. Well, it's actually, crazy. To be fair, to be fair, one of them says that I think we're just interpreting it this differently. <laughs> so that was a much better way of of presenting that. But that, that, imagine getting famous for something like that. You're in Iowa. You would never be famous for anything else ever. <laughs> suddenly you're on national news and Stephen Colbert and on all kinds of parody sites and all of this because you said this thing. 
this stupid thing for which you will remem- remembered for the rest of your life. <laughs> Dude, that's that's interesting. I saw a video recently. It was put out years ago, and it was uh, pretty much why people believe in gods. And he went into a naturalist, evolutionist explanation. Brilliant man. Um, I want to try and interview him if it's possible. I don't know if it will be. But Stephen Hawkins, I believe, and, and others inspired him. Um, but he was doing it for Richard Dawkins. Uh, it was Who is a, this guy? That's a great question because <laughs> it, it's – and you, I'm sure, have seen it for sure. You, If you haven't seen this – no, I know for a fact you've probably seen this because it was so brilliant. He went into everything, uh, the evolutionary mechanisms as to why back in prehistory and showed why humans would invoke something like this and how it's actually normal that – we fill in the gaps. We don't understand something, so we put things there. And you know, each culture has done something different, whether it was the elves or angels or you know, gods, God, or some evolved form of explaining the unexplainable to them from their perception. And as we've developed, I had one guy tell me, he says, as science develops, we'll start to really grasp uh, things and it'll make sense of them, kind of like, I've heard Yahweh was a volcanic deity at one point. Okay, I don't know how true. I've heard some yeah, arguments. But... There, there are you, – you, people that are interested in this can just look up the phrase in Google for a moment, and it will give you all the references to it. There are 60 times that Yahweh is described as a volcano in the Old Testament. Six, so you to just type in that phrase. I think, I think Google will pull it up just with that. 60 times Yahweh is called a, a volcano. Uh, it, it, and people don't notice it because they, they read in Exodus where they're, 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 they are following something when actually they're just seeing something on the horizon and going toward that, right? So they're, they are following what is a column of smoke by day and a column of fire by night. Well, what's that? Right. <laughs> yeah, that it that is interesting. And the burning bush, there's there's oh, some... the burning bush is not even a bush. It's it's not a shrubbery. It's <laughs> oh man, I don't know if they're ready for this. So uh, yeah. so do you? And I want to ask point blank because I've been watching you for a minute. I love your stuff. I said, how do I get a hold of them? And I just was being too lazy to really dig and try to find a way to contact you, and didn't realize your email was on the left side of your website there. And I said. Let me email this guy and try and get him on the show. <laughs> I see that you've been influenced by a lot of guys like me. Um, I've been influenced by Dr. Carrier, Dr. Price, um, uh, David Fitzgerald, these guys in a lot of ways. And I also listen to historicists too. Um, I try to find common ground. I try to see where there's evidence. I'm agnostic whether or not there was a historical Jesus, but I'm prone to think the lack of evidence from my my point of view, I would think there's not sufficient to be so certain like someone like Dr. Ehrman is. And what are your thoughts on it? Well, even even Ehrman's arguments uh, for the historicity of Jesus, I think, fall short. I mean, so and, and I'm all, I also want to clarify that of the three names of Fitzgerald and um, and Price and Carrier that uh I'm not so much in carrier's camp. Everybody, I mean, th- that's the one that people want to associate. If you if you declare yourself a, a mythicist, people think that you're 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 following uh, a carrier's argument, which never quite resonated with me. Right. I mean, because he's he's talking about angelography, uh, Hebrew angelography, that would be compelling if if I could verify it, but I don't know how to verify what he's saying. Uh, now I've I've talked to uh, Fitzgerald and I asked him about well here's here's one of the things that, that I would argue for a historical Jesus I mean we got this we have this one case where uh, it's talking about J- Jesus coming back uh, to to the fig tree right he there's no figs on the tree and so he curses the tree and it causes it to wither and everything I'm like this is obviously a bullshit story but it's about a guy who is too stupid to know when the when the the figs are in season or worse when he tries to uh, to cure somebody of blindness and it doesn't work. Right. Or when he when he goes back to his hometown and he can't perform his miracles because everybody, you know, because familiarity breeds contempt and, and people will say, what, you know, we're supposed to believe you're some holy man. You're the kid from the hood. We know you. We're not going to believe your bullshit. Well, so that doesn't work. So Jesus says that, you know, that a physician, which is a really loose translation, uh, is not respected in his own hometown. Yeah, a bullshit artist will not be believed by the people who know him is another way that you can phrase that. Because Jesus was only a faith healer, a first century faith healer who wanted to take money for the poor, which is just like every other faith healer takes money for the poor. And then you find out that that charity doesn't really exist, but that they're just living off that money themselves. So that's what Jesus is doing, right? He's going from town to town, taking people's money 
for the poor and then just going to the next town. So you take, take a historicist approach, though, at today? Now, here's the problem. And I gave I gave a okay. speech explaining this in uh, what was it called? Uh, I, 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 Mythical Man. Mythical Man was the name of the speech. Uh, the description was, I think that there is at least one. And here's the problem. It's not just one historical guy. We know. That on the mythical aspect, that the, the story of Jesus is based on, among other things, Dionysus, right? And Prometheus. I mean, <laughs> shut up. He was just trying to tell you who else it was based <laughs> off of. <laughs> he tries to have communications with other dogs in other parts of the neighborhood through our walls. That's that's a problem. And if he hears any noise, then, then it's that it. You know, he yeah. might but be anyway. hearing me. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> He's, he does that sometimes. I'll be listening to a video. If a new voice comes on and suddenly he charges in to bark, I'm like, it's the computer. Shut up. But anyway, great dog, guard, guard dog can't complain about that. Where was I? Oh, yeah. Um, so reading Dionysus, I mean, like years and years ago. I'm reading Dionysus and and, uh, and over the, one of the one of the uh, the original accounts or the oldest accounts of Dionysus and they're talking you know translated into English of course where he says that uh, yeah, that he is the vine and he is the fruit of the vine I'm like that's the shit Jesus was saying right so what what is the what is the most recent date that this this could have been written all right so this is we know that this is at least what was it something like 503 years before Jesus minimum. Right. Minimum, it's at least that much older than Jesus, but it's the same stuff, right? And Prometheus, Prometheus, I think, is even 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 older, right? So Prometheus was crucified to atone for uh, for forbidden knowledge given to man. So he's a, he's crucified for the to atone for the sins of man, but it's a much worse crucifixion than what Jesus has to go through. And Jesus's crucifixion kind of emulates what happened to Alcestis, who was another Greek character who who uh, lost a bet, if I remember right, and she had to go to hell for three days, and then Hercules had to go down to hell to rec rescue her. So she's in hell for three. So you just take Jesus, and he's part of part of Prometheus, part of Dionysus, part of Alcestis, a part of a handful of other things. These are just all these other stories. That, why do we see all these parallels? Oh, look at here. Krishna is giving sight to the blind. Now Krishna is a dick about it. I mean, he, he doesn't he doesn't actually give sight to that blind person. He does it only for a moment because that that blind guy, and this is in the Mahabharata, the, the blind guy says that he wants to, to look upon Krishna's glory. And Krishna gives him sight so that he can see how cute Krishna is. And then he takes his sight away again. But Krishna was a dick. That uh, that actually <laughs> sounds it's funny you say I love this. I love this. Please bring keep bringing this. That sounds a lot like um if you look at Jesus after he heals the blind man, he also gives him kind of like a don't go sinning anymore. Almost like this is a better story than the Krishna one they're trying to create by saying we're going to let you keep your your uh, sight, but don't go sinning. If you sin anymore, I'm going to take it from you. Like almost like that could be how you could see it there. I don't. He doesn't say I'm going to take it from you, but he does say go and sin no more. Makes you kind of wonder. Why? What's wrong with uh? What, what if I sin? What happens? You know? Well, there's a lot of parallels with not with not just Jesus, but I mean throughout. I and mean, since we're talking about Krishna, there was a, there's a moment in um I don't know if it's in the Bhagavad Gita or if it's elsewhere in the Mahabharata. I can't remember, but Krishna is escorting his friend Arjuna, and they encounter a, uh, a I think it was a, a lake god, and so Arjuna, the king, has to do battle with this lake god. And the god tried to cheat by by hitting him in, in a bit, especially essentially in the junk, hitting him below the belt, right? So the nut shot. And Arjuna still wins. I mean, he's he's wrestling a, a god and he still wins, even though the god cheated by punching him in the nards. Wasn't that the same story that we, we see in Genesis 30 when when uh <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't kick him in or hit him in the nards, but he ding sure well, hits. No, that's, it's the same isn't thing. it the socket of the hip? Oh, good point. Touched him in the hollow of the thigh. That's his junk. Exactly. <laughs> oh, <laughs> snap. This is interesting. Yeah, so it was it's exactly the same story, but told from the other perspective, right? So now, uh, so but, and then also the characters are always recast. Why is it that they always recast the characters? You know, if you read the Quran, 
you'll notice that, hey, this name and this name are exactly the same character. This is the same story as these things from the Bible. But they changed the name. Why did they? Why would you change the name? It's the same character. Everybody acknowledges this is the same character. It's Zeus and Jupiter. They're the same guy, right? We just, it's a different culture, so we call them a different name. So the same thing happened with like Noah, right? Well, originally it was the Asudra, and then it became Utnapishtim, and and and, uh, and Atrahasis, and, and then it was another one that uh, I forget the, the name of. It was actually a much later one. So they, eventually you get the, the pagan version of Noah, and then you get what is eventually the, the, the Jewish version of Noah. And they both appear at about the same time. And we know that everybody's ripping off everybody else's story. Never verbatim, never entirely. Like uh, the whole Adam and Eve thing, it was, it was bizarre when I'm, reading, um, when I'm reading Mesopotamian mythology back in the day. And I, and I happen across this thing where uh, Enki, a visit, he goes into the sacred garden of Inanna, right? Now this is, and then see, he starts eating the fruit that is growing in, in Inanna's sacred garden. And then she finds him eating these forbidden fruit. And she cursed him. He's a god, but he fell. So now she has a fallen immortal. And now she, she laments this, that she wants to forgive what she's done, which is a typical god thing to do. And so she she bears, what is it, seven daughters to cure the wounds that he received from eating forbidden fruit in the sacred garden and becoming a fallen immortal. And one of them, Ninti, was called daughter of the rib, for she was meant to close the, the wound to his side. And I'm like, where have I read this line before? It's in a much <laughs> more recent book. Right. right. So then yeah, I was in a I was in a class of a, a comparative history of world religions, uh, and and this Christian pipes up and says, "Well, well, the, the 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 Christian Bible came first, and all of these pagan lessons or all these pagan legends came out of that." And and so the the minister, who's a Methodist, or not the the, the professor, is a Methodist, right? And he's he he has a doctorate in in divinity and everything. And he's been all to these sites in 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 uh, in uh, Asia and everywhere. And he's he's really competent in this. And he has to explain to this kid that it's not possible for the Genesis account to be the original, and for all of these other myths to be somehow based on that, because it's never the big thing that remains true. It's it's the trivial details, right? The fallen immortal, the wound to the side of it. It's a different collection of gods. And then there was another one called uh, Adapa. And Adapa is, uh, he's taken to meet the gods, and he's warned that the gods are tricksters. And that if they offer him any food, then it's likely to be poison. So he should, refu he should refuse to eat whatever they offer him. But instead of offering him poisoned food, the gods offer him the fruit of forever life. And because Adapa did not eat, of the, the fruit of eternal life, well, that meant that he is mortal. And nobody catches the parallel in that because everybody conveniently forgets that in the Genesis account, there's also, there's two trees. There's the tree of knowledge of, of good and evil, which is obviously a parable, right? Everywhere in the Bible that talks about the eating of the fruit of, or the fruit of meaning the result of actions or decisions. Only only in Genesis are we supposed to accept that that's literal, which right. of course it can't be, right? That knowledge, <laughs> eat of the fruit of free of knowledge of good and evil means that if you know knowledge of good and evil, then you will you will change your state of mind, you will understand morality, and you'll never be able to be the innocent chi animal-like child that you were before. So it's like the old adage that you can't ever go home again. But that right at the right at the end of, of uh, is it Genesis three that God says that He has to take Adam out of the garden, lest he eat from the fruit of eternal life because then he would live forever. Mm -hmm. And that means that Adam was not already immortal. Couldn't have been. What if Adam had not eaten from the fruit of a tree of eternal life or the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good evil? What if Adam had never eaten from either tree? If he had never eaten from the fruit of eternal life, he would not have eternal life. He would die, right? If he'd never eaten from either tree at all, what would happen? Of course, he would die. So Adam cannot be immortal. And, the, and these are all stories that are adapted from other stories. I mean, like, it was like, let us make man in our image. That came from Enuma Elish, the oldest creation myth, where you have seven gods. They're the, they're the sixth generation of gods. 
So it talks about what the first generation did, the second generation did created this, and the third generation created that, and then finally we get to the sixth, the sixth divine generation created man, so that man would complete creation such that the seventh generation of gods could rest. Where the hell we get that from, right? Because it, it's 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 ridiculous to to imagine the god, right? The the all powerful god is needing a rest. But when your gods are just people with magic powers, it's easier to understand that. So how do how do they create this god, or how do they they create man? Well, they they create seven with fourteen figurines. This collection of gods creates fourteen figurines. Uh, clay figurines. And they're, they're using the golem spell, which in old Hebrew magic was where you create a, 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 a human-like figure of something, and then you either put a spell in its mouth or you breathe into it the breath of life, because they thought that air was spirit. That's why you, evaporating alcohol is called spirits, because you can see the distortion, right? That's why they, they thought that dust devils are literal devils. That's why, <laughs> <sighs> that's why smoke coming out of a volcano is the spirit of God. Right. It's because they thought they thought clouds moving and thought that was God because it, it's movement of air. They didn't know that air was particulate matter, but they knew that you would die if you can't breathe. So in that line where Jesus says, you know, that, um, that where it says that Jesus gave up the ghost in another translation, it says that he gave up his spirit or that he breathed his last. Right. <laughs> and then in Ecclesiastes, it says that uh, that. Um, who knows whether the breath of the beast goes down into the earth or the breath of man ascends to heaven. Breath of man. But in another translation, it becomes spirit again. So spirit and breath, air, they're the same thing. And the entomolo- or, or etymologists will, will explain that the, the actual origins of that word, yeah, they, they thought it was air. If you do this, you, that's air. If you if you, bad spirits, foul, uh, foul air, would would believed to cause disease. Well, they don't realize that you know the things stink. Therefore, there's bacteria causing the stink that is also infectious. They don't make that correlation because they don't know. So they, they 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 think that air is supernatural spirits. That that's what it is. So they breathe the breath of life into whatever. So they make these little figurines and they breathe the breath of life into them to bring them into life. That's and that's exactly what what uh, Adam is. If you read Jewish descriptions of this. They describe it as a golem spell. They describe it the creation of Adam as a golem spell, which is magic, but the Christians will just refuse to. And then the Muslims don't have a problem with it. Jews will accept that it's magic. The Muslims accept that it's magic. They're all talking about Adam. But the Christians say, well, no, we can't use the word magic. Why? I don't know, because we just don't want to admit that. It's like Republicans admitting that Trump is guilty. It's like, <laughs> they're just not allowed to say that. So something I wanted to poke at. No, no, there's one more. Oh, there's go ahead, more. go ahead, go ahead. Since we're talking about mythicism, okay, how do they generate the the power? The gods needed something to generate the power to cre- to create life. Isn't that an interesting concept? The way that they did that was by sacrificing one of their own. They killed one of their own gods, and then these figurines that they were making were soaked in the blood of the slain god. The sacrificed God. The you get this? Yes, yes. So and... they are brought to life by being soaked in the blood. Where have I heard this before? Hmm. <laughs> hmm. <It's... laughs> but this is this is way older than this is older than Zoroastrianism, which is older than Judaism, which is older than Christianity. That's the problem I have with historicism, right? So one of the problems that I hear. Is this, and I'm not saying could there be, I I always say this, like there could be a guy at the bottom, like we talked about, could be multiple guys, okay? In fact, I would go so far as to say even the ideas of, um, you know, the two thieves and Jesus, you could say one of two things in my, and this is just like the closest things I could say, like in terms of contemporary um, situations that were going on in the history, because they always want to go, what's the closest? Don't go back 5,000 years to try and pull something. Get it close. Okay. Josephus' autobiography, okay, there could be a, a taken from there where his three pals are on the cross and one gets taken down and actually lives, the other two die by a physician. Or you could go back to Joseph, which I can show parallels line by line almost where Judah, Judas, 
sells off his brother into slavery for silver. He gets taken by the uh, Malachi, whatever the heck their names were, to Egypt, ends up in Potiphar's house, Pontius Pilate. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Let me not jump forward here. I don't mean to do any <laughs> weird things. So so Potiphar's house gets cast into the dungeon or in the earth or in the belly of the well. I meant inside of the heart of the earth. That's what I meant to say. And he ends up overseeing this chamber and two guys have dreams. One is a baker. One is a wine man. So you have the bread and the wine. And when Joseph goes to tell the wine guy when he gets taken back up to, to Pharaoh, because he was going to live, resurrected to eternal life or resurrected to death, which the baker had his head cut off and was put on a spike. The wine guy, he says, hey, remember me. Don't forget about me. Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me. What the hell's going on? So when I started seeing this, I knew right away. Wow, what a great myth. What a great copy of an older story. And Jesus fits that narrative. I think that fits even better than the uh, the the parallel to um, uh, I'm brain fart just now. His three pals I was just mentioning, Josephus. And could it be utilized? Could Josephus be BSing and using the same Joseph myth? Absolutely. There's no telling what could have been you know going on here to apply to that situation. But the idea that you just brought up about the gods. That's the problem I see with a lot of historicists. They get so into trying to, you know, historicize this that I think they're lumping some stuff that's mythology into the context and don't know where to draw the line. I don't think any of us can absolutely in every essence draw the line. This is why it's all probability. But I love what you said, Jesus being the last Adam, which was a possibly mortal possible immortal kind of weird situation here where this guy has been cast down well it says in philippians paul says he came down willingly lowering himself below whether he was an angel as as we see with uh dr carrier or whether he was just some other god kind of figure a demigod copying greco-roman mythology in some way or even serapis osiris dionysus something else and he comes down and What's he do? Exactly what you said. Another creation. So it's a new creation, right? Here we are back to Adam with the first creation where they're breathing life in. And Jesus turns to his disciples and he says he breathes on them or something in one of the hidden rooms or something. This is awesome seeing it like that, though. I think that that's the closest I can get to the beauty of the story is seeing that it is a myth and that it that is exactly what it is. But looking at it the way we're looking at it now, I actually like this stuff. Like I like catching it, seeing, oh, haha, you were copying that story. Nice try. It's like discovering that has freed me because I don't have to believe it. I can call it for what it is. And it's an old myth. It worked for superstitious people in a time in which they did not have what we have today. And that's okay. It's it's part of something that happened. But the fact that we're still doing this today, that's where I'm like, ah, when are we going to grow up? When are we going to stop turning to weird stuff and telling our kids, no, 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 we're going to pray for you. You don't have to go to the hospital. No, 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 no. To the addicts, because I'm a recovering addict. To the addicts, no, 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 just pray to God and, and, and you'll be okay. No, go see a, a real doctor because you have a real problem. And you're on benzodiazepines and alcohol. You're going to die, dude. You know what I'm saying? Like, anyway, Aaron. Christianity is Aaron. largely about uh, shirking responsibility. And Christians, of course, will not recognize this because they think that we don't believe, that unbelievers don't believe because we want to shirk responsibility. We're taking responsibility. We can't say the devil made us do it. Right. We we don't we don't break the law because we know it's the law. We know people invented the law, not God. Right. And so we're going to do what we can to to uh, to support and, and enforce the law, whereas Christians very often will try to say, well, it, it doesn't matter that I sexually molested my sister because Jesus has forgiven me. And so I shouldn't be criminalized because, you know, that argument was made. By the Duggar family trying to get out of, of prosecution. And lots of different Christians, once once they got under charges, they try to use that argument. I'm soaked in the blood. And so I don't have to go up on charges. And that's 
gift. You see, that way you don't actually have to do anything to help people. You can just pray for them that they'll accidentally get the help that they need without you doing anything about it, because that's another shirking of responsibility, and that it doesn't matter how badly we we mess up this planet, because Jesus is going to come back any minute now to destroy everything anyway, so it doesn't matter if we try to preserve our resources, because we don't need to, because we are in the last days, and we've been in the last days for 2,000 years. <laughs> Right. <laughs> well, we just oh. keep making shit worse. But the big problem here is between in the in the mythicism historicism is arguments like 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 Bart Ehrman. You try to put him in in a in a, a category where you have uh, Ehrman's argument and you and Ehrman's argument is that Jesus existed, but he wasn't the Christ. Okay, so that's a step away from you know the the, the, the typical Christian argument that Jesus existed and he's God. Right, or he's the son of God, or the more Muslim and Jewish argument that he did he's a prophet of God, or that he's just a shyster pretending that he knows God. You know, he's he's Joe Biden saying, I know I know Obama. Um, but and then on the <laughs> other side, on the other extreme side, we have Richard Carrier, who says there's absolutely no truth of the Jesus myth at all. It's entirely mythological or mythological, and there was no guy. Well, well, Ehrman, I'm sorry, um, Price and Fitzgerald. I think are a little more close, a little closer to my camp. And I certainly, I know that Price is, because uh, much of my inspiration actually comes from him. He said some things that are going to seem, seem a little crazy too. But when w- one of the things that, that Price has argued is that when you read Josephus, and Josephus has talked about how he found three people being crucified, and that he recognized one of them or you recognized his friends, and that t- and that he he went to the magistrate. I forget the name. Uh, ter- uh, anyway, I, I can't remember the name. You, yeah, I always have these moments, but in a name that I could recall at any other time, I don't have now. But anyway, he went to to go get the the Roman magistrate to have these friends cut down, and they are cut down. And then uh, one of them died, or two of them died, and one lived. I think is I think is the way it was. And then this is all being viewed from the opposite perspective when you read Luke, and suddenly you see Joseph of Arimathea, which is dangerously close to Joseph Arimathias. Joseph of Arimathea, Joseph Arimathias. Now, if you look at how much the, the Muslims have corrupted the name of, of Noah and the name of, uh, of uh, Ecclesiastes or the name of Satan, how they've changed that just, just in that little bit of time. Imagine, it's not, it's not hard to see how these names were corrupted, you know, between Joseph Arimathias and Joseph of Arimathea. Right. So it looks like when you read Luke, that, we're talking about the same event. These people are both writing stories, looking at each other while they're, while they're doing it. This is according to, to Bob Price. And I thought, okay, that's, that's an out there kind of a theory. But it kind of makes sense. When you think about this, and because other people are going to say, well, we have all of this other documentation of Jesus. Do you? Really? One of the problems is that when, G- when Joseph mentions uh the James, the brother of Jesus, the anointed. He's not talking about that Jesus. He's talking about Jesus of Damnius. Son of Dan, yeah. Who lived at a different time and is a completely different character. We know who that character was. We've got historical documentation for that guy. We don't have it for, for your Jesus, but we got it for this Jesus. We know that that's a different Jesus. Josephus wrote about 19 GZI. 19 different Jesuses. So, if, and Jesus of Damnius ain't your guy. Now, Christians will adamantly argue that, that he is, and until you prove absolutely that he is not, because that's what they need, absolute proof that their belief is wrong. They don't need the slightest proof that it's true. Right. But they need absolute proof that it's wrong, because they're going to be completely unreasonable. Of course, of course. I mean, you know, <laughs> yeah. The, the problem is, is that it, there's a... I, I, like, I like to look at things in a, in a bell curve. You know, I, I try not to, to think in binary terms where you're good or evil or whatever. That most people on most subjects, we're, we're kind of around here toward the middle. And then it just becomes a, an issue of are we slightly left of or right of center is what it comes down to most of the time. So, and I, again, I try not to be, I try not to deal with too many absolutes. There, right, right. There are a few. <laughs> there are a few things we know that we're absolutely certain, like, there was never a global flood. We know that for absolutely certain. But it's not the all best you can do is go back to Ice Age. That's like the best you can do. And even then, I don't know if water covered every mountain. I mean, come on. Like, no. We can actually go back a lot further than that to previous Ice Ages, pre-Cambrian Ice Ages, 
at least two identified so far, where the entire planet is covered in a thin sheet of frost, at least. Right. So anyway. Uh, and they, and they, they wanted to call it an ice age where everything was frozen, but the fact is that it would have to have been thin because there's not that much water <laughs> on the planet. So like a thin frost, a thin frost, and then some actual liquid water in some pockets here and there. So uh, getting back to the getting back to the subject, uh, there there was a historic element to Jesus. It wasn't like Richard Carrier says, whether it's where it's just purely mythology. And when Bart Ehrman is talking about, well, we have record that there was, well, we, we have all these indications. Most of what he's talking about is simply Christian historians that grew up Christian. We're never going to question that, right? They're just never going to come about questioning. Well, they, they, they always argue for consensus. Well, all these historians accept that Jesus was true. Well, yeah, they do when they were raised never to question that. And it's the ones that question them to say, you know what, I'm not sure if Jesus did exist. Well, now you're a mythicist and now you're outside and now you're, we're going to shun you. But what the argument really is, is when we're talking about Jesus, I've heard arguments from Christians where they're actually talking about um, Jesus ben Ananias. And I'm like, that reference that you're talking about, that's not Jesus of Nazareth. That's not your Jesus. That's this other Jesus again. So then we have one of Ehrman's books where Ehrman himself brings up this, these, the, like the 16 different gospels that never made it into the book. And so we have a hero character that everybody's talking about. And where did this hero come from, right? Well, there might have been a real guy at the base of some of this, some of this. But then when you get to where um, we have certain books that are kicked out because he, he killed a child in one of these books, in one of these gospels that didn't make it. Wasn't he a child too or something? He was a child who performed magic on something because the kid was mad at or some crap. I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and I, I like another one that was rejected, which is the Gospel of Thomas, uh, in which Jesus said the only wise thing that Jesus has ever said in any of his Gospels, period, and it's one that didn't get in the book. Uh, in the Gospel of Thomas, they ask him, what do, you think about cruci- uh, what do you think about circumcision? And Jesus says, if God wanted the people to be circumcised, we would have been born without foreskins. Yep, that's right, that's right. There you go! <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the only wise thing Jesus ever uttered, and that didn't make it into the book either. So there's another problem. So I, I argued with Fitzgerald, as I started to say earlier, that there are some things that Jesus did that are just so stupid that we would have to believe that this is a person that did this. There was a first first century faith healer out there conning people who doesn't know when the fig season is, who who doesn't know that farmers in his time at that time, in, in his in his location at that time, knew that there were seeds smaller, other seeds, like the black orchid that are smaller than the mustard seed. Jesus isn't a farmer, right? He claims to be a carpenter, maybe because he got wood. I don't know. But then this is why he's hanging out with male apostles. But Uh he... (laughs) (laughs) And yeah, which is something that Paul had issues with because he obviously hated women and was seemingly closet (sighs) queer himself. Yeah, I mean, and why is it that the most adamantly anti-homosexual people are the ones that are against want you? Yeah, against you being with a woman. The ones that you, the ones that we catch having sex with a male prostitute in the car, or snorting coke off their ass of a male prostitute, or uh, going into a hotel room with a rent-a-boy whose advertising criteria was that he had an eight-inch uncircumcised penis. What? That's, <laughs> rent, this- yeah. That's a weird and the, the ah that's a weird and he was Brazilian. <laughs> oh my gosh! Well, I tell you this real quick on the fig tree thing. I I know that if we literalize that, of course, the fig tree. I know for a fact the small seed thing. That's obvious. But for the fig tree, I'm not so certain it's supposed to be taken literal in the aspect of whether it is meant to be Israel and and really even if it isn't literal, it's still bad because what it's saying is it's anti-Semitic in many ways because it's saying. The, the fig tree, it, this this Israel's about to end. It's like really this anti-Semitic notion I get from the text is that, you know, God's taking away what he had with the sons of Abraham and he's going to have new people seated at the table. It's like, oh, snap, what's going on here? But exactly I, what David Fitzgerald said. Right. That's that's what he was explaining to me when I when I said that this 
this shows a fallibility of humanity. This, but, but he says, it, but it doesn't really, because all of these things are parallels, and, and, and all, each of these words refers to or implies or means. There's supposed to, which is why I hate arguing scripture, because I, mean, I, I can read what it says and I can criticize what it says, but when, but when they always say, well, when it says this, it really means that, right? <laughs> except on every other Thursday, or except when the moon is full, or when I want to argue with somebody else about a different thing. Then it becomes literal again, but until then, it's metaphorical, or it's metaphorical when I can't defend it, and literal when I just want to make believe. Right, right. Yeah. So, well, I heard this argument with Dr. Bob, and I'm sure you would attest to this because you brought up some fascinating things earlier and now. Um, Dr. Bob was debating William Lane Craig on this, and William Lane Craig attacked the dying and rising God theme, right? Which we all, you, me, and Dr. Bob totally agree that it's there. I mean, it may not be exactly the way you want it. You know, this God might not have been a man in any way, shape, or form over here that's Osiris or something else. And Jesus might be caricatured as a man. Oh, let's not talk like that. That's totally different things. I hear historicists argue that all the time. Anywho, um, on that note, I wish that Dr. Bob nailed this uh, this idea on the cross here during their debate because he said, well, the problem with the dying and rising God thing is all the other dying and rising gods are agricultural. However, the New Testament's not. It's historical, this, this, that. Are you kidding me? Look at the parables. Listen to the the agricultural use of the wheat and the chaff. And the, uh, come on, man, are you you're telling me this has no agricultural implication, and that this is not another possible rewrite of Dionysus, the vine, the grape? The this is agriculture. It, I just I maybe I'm looking into it differently. They just can't see what we're looking at, or the Christians are avoiding these things like the plague. So what I suspect. Uh, is the case is I think that there was a faith healer who had a strong following and was also got in trouble over this. Uh, and then we have subsequently we have lumped onto him these legends about how he's supposed to return. And uh, like like the the one beautiful thing where where Jesus says that he he hopes he doesn't return in winter because uh, you know that'll be cold. But he doesn't understand that that the earth is a sphere. <laughs> 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 and in the other hemisphere, it's not winter. When it's winter up here, it's not winter down there. So it doesn't matter if it's winter. It's always winter somewhere, or you know, it's always the opposite season somewhere else. And Jesus says that uh, that he he testifies verily that of those few of you who are standing with me now, that not all of you will have tasted death. Some will, but not all. I will have even tasted death before you see me returning at the right in the clouds at the right hand of power, which is pretty explicit. We're going to see Jesus return while some of these guys are still alive, and then they want to come up with every kind of uh, interpretation for how it's not it's death in the body but not in the spirit. Well, how can it only be some of them then? You know? <laughs> yeah, no, I like that. Doesn't work. So we have a faith healer. And on and there was a, at a time when Jesus was a common name, and people are commonly lumping different GZI together. And then, as you noted, well, we've got we've got so many dangerous parallels with 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 Joseph, and then also with uh, with uh, um, John the Baptist, right? And then with Moses too, right? We have so many different. And they're obviously just borrowing interesting elements. It's like when we watched. Uh, remember the movie uh, Independence Day? I remember reading this brilliant article. This is the things that Independence Day was based on, or the tropes that they borrowed from previous movies. I never so saw the, it. So the only the only novel, the only new thing about Independence Day was that the spaceships were 15 miles across. <laughs> wow. The, the spaceships were bigger than any spaceship had ever been seen in a in a in a in not even Star Wars would have a spaceship inside the orbit that would be that big, right? That was it. So they show all of these things, and when they show when they show this in Independence Day, this is when we first saw this in 1952's The Day They Come, whatever, you know. And and when the the head of no, this was a different movie. They did the same thing when they did um, uh, Cloverfield. You know, they said yeah. they, they the scene where the with the, uh, the the Statue of Liberty's head, and they said, okay, we've also seen this in this movie, and in this movie, and in this. And I think Independence Day was one of the movies that that was previous and then there was another one previous to that. So, I mean, there's, there's tropes that people borrow that it just, it, it's just the way that people tell stories. That's why we can't find anything absolutely novel. And you would, and then this was my thought. I was, I was hanging out with some pagans back in the day 
And this one guy declared himself that Dionysus was his patron deity. And I said, well, my problem is that Dionysus was, was said to turn water into wine, but not like Jesus did. Jesus did it like, like Penn and Teller did it, where they, they pour water into a jug and then they turn the jugs upside down and pour water out, right? Well, anybody can do that. Penn and Teller did that. But what Dionysus did was he made the springs of the earth spring forth wine. Now, I'm not saying that anybody was ever actually there or actually saw wine coming out of springs. Obviously, that, this is just a story. None of that really happened, right? It, it doesn't have to be, there, doesn't, there does not have to be a kernel of truth to that. Just something somebody made up, but people want to, to put things, when they, when they have a hero, we start lumping shit onto it. And my position is that we've done that so many times in more recent history with Vlad Tepes, with Robin the Hood, and with Arthur, King of the Britons. In each case, there's a historical element that has nothing to do with the legends that are built around it. And we don't even know anymore what that what that kernel of truth is. But we know, like in Robin Hood's case, Maid Marian, made up. She does not even appear in the story until centuries later. Suddenly she appears, and then she's in every version after that. There's a Maid Marian. Uh, Robin of Loxley, that was that was the name of the supposed to be. There, there might have been a Robin of Loxley. We know that there was a, a John Little that had like 17 kids. That's that's the, the kernel of truth that we've got to that story. <laughs> Right, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> that's a lot to hinge on, right? I, you know, exactly. the, this taking this back to Jesus in what you're saying here, I know I'm going to sound a little crazy probably to some people who are your fans, but that's okay. It's I'm just I speculate. And one thing I learned is just to evolve my ideas as I learn. I don't think it's too far fetched, and neither does Doctor Bob to suspect some kernel of legend on Caesar being applied to the coming of Jesus as Titus. As some would suspect, I'm not saying everything that Joseph Atwell espouses is obviously in the vein of accuracy. Okay, and I'm not saying yeah, you, he's know, a, you know he's not even among mythicists. Right, Atwell does not have a good reputation, and of course, mythicists have a shitty reputation against everybody that wants to just take the status quo. Right, and and not put any challenge to that. So I'm I'm very hesitant. Right. to adopt anything that Atwell has suggested, and and I don't I don't automatically subscribe to whatever carrier. Right. Has 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 suggested, even though I understand what he's saying, I just don't know how to verify it to the conclusion that he has. What seems to me, and after talking to a number of others, and especially Price, about some of how some of this was put together, is that people are confusing and conflating different people named Jesus. So I think if you could find any of the historic sources for Jesus, maybe there were only two or three of them, but any of them, and even if there was only one, even if there was only one guy at the basis, if there was one first century faith healer, and he's in the first century because there's uh, there's evidence that he might have been, there's indications in history in history that he might have been earlier, that the, that the legends that are based on Jesus are actually based yeah, on an earlier years, character. Years, baby. Yeah, well, another another hundred years, another century earlier. Yes, I mean, and some of that comes from the early church fathers, I because know that they the Jews in the Talmud. And the, and the and the early church fathers seem to be talking about a. They don't realize. They, are, did they realize? Does did Justin Martyr realize that he could have met someone who had met Jesus? Because he's not talking about a Jesus who lived a generation or two earlier. <laughs> you know, I mean, it, 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 actually, a little bit more than that. But it is still possible that he could that that Justin Martyr could have met somebody who had met Jesus. You know, it's I think if I remember the dates right, I think it's I think he's still within the range of a human lifetime from that. But what he's writing about is a character that predates Hercules. Who who pre who predates uh, you know how you have Apollo carting the sun across the sky in one myth and then you have Helios, the same character, essentially carting the sun across the sky in another one. Well, Jesus is also depicted as carting the sun, the sun across the sky. Jesus is this is the sun god. Jesus is described in Psalm 19, according to Justin Martyr. So he doesn't seem to be thinking that Jesus was a guy who died just a few years earlier, or just say two or three decades earlier. You know, he's he's not thinking of Jesus that way. He's and obviously not two or three decades. Substantially longer, but just barely within the range of a human lifetime. He's talking about somebody from the basis of the Old Testament, at least the way I read it. 
And other people have other people have interpreted that maybe what he's saying is that Satan went back in time to create these pagan gods to make them counterfeits of Jesus. Right. But nobody, nobody ever suggested time travel at that time in history. Not one author ever suggested time travel was possible. That's a that's a new science fiction topic. Justin Martyr definitely was not progressive enough to imagine time travel. He thought Jesus was eternal. Jesus existed from the beginning. Jesus is is the son, essentially. Jesus existed in Psalm 9. Jesus predates all of these pagan gods. Jesus didn't live in the, the, the fourth decade of the first millennium. Jesus was several millennia ago, is the way that I interpret it. I've, I've heard somebody had a criticism of, of, of my interpretation of that. And I just, I remember that there was a criticism. I can't remember what it was or how valid it might have been. So I'm sure somebody yeah, no, will remind me. Yeah, someone watching this because my – I love my fans. I mean I'm seriously – I love going through the comments and listening to people's ideas. And there's so many – there's some that are just over the top. And I'm like, okay, uh, this guy just took a hit of something. I don't know what he put in his bong. But... <laughs> <laughs> so, here, so here's my thought in a summary. Even if we were to imagine that it's not multiple – Jesus is being combined and conflated, which I think is almost certain. And there's not going to be any historic record for probably any of these guys, if that's the case. But even if there was only one guy, it's not going to be that guy. That if we had a time machine, I'm certain about this. If we had a time machine and could go back and it was somebody that spoke Aramaic and just hunt down, you're not going to find Jesus. You go back to 32 CE, you're not going to find Jesus. You'll find 50 other GZI. You'll, you'll, you'll find Grim Chapman from you know, uh, Life of Brian. <laughs> you're you're going to find a whole bunch of apostles because you, you, you Jews produce messiahs by the sackful, is what they used to say, right? Or what they said in Jesus Christ Superstar, and I've read it in other places too. And I think, you know, it, because the Bible actually does make that comment that the Jews would keep producing all these messiahs. So they're getting them all combined and conflated. But even if there was only one guy, if there, there, even if there's just one Jesus who somehow was born in both Galilee and Nazareth or is from both places uh, and, and also went to Egypt without going more than 50 miles from where he was born. If you, I mean, if you, if you take out all of the contradictions, there's one guy somehow did all of this. Right. Put him in your TARDIS. Bring him... Bring him into the 1970s and let him see Jesus Christ Superstar. If you don't tell him in advance, he would not know that story was about him. How can there be a historic Jesus if that Jesus character doesn't recognize his own story? Would Vlad Tepes recognize Bram Stoker's Dracula as no. being about him? No. Take him to any Dracula movie. <laughs> Vlad Tepes is not going to know who the hell that character is. This has nothing to do with him. Same, same thing with King, uh, King Arthur. Same thing with Robin Hood. None of these characters would recognize their own stories. Robin Hood, what I think, would be the most outraged. Because we, we remember and glorify all these things that we've attributed to Robin Hood that we know were all, all of these details were added centuries later. Everything we know about Robin Hood was, was made up centuries later. We know nothing about Robin Hood from his actual life, apart from that he might have known Little John. And that's it. I, I totally agree with you. I mean, if you just, on Jesus for a moment with the magnifying glass in the 30s, if, if this is when, because we got other corroborating evidence to suggest Pontius Pilate, Pontius Pilate, right? That's when they place his death. You only got a 12-year window right there. And if you put it in that 12-year window and you look at the story about it in the synoptics, you run into some issues. I mean, you have Jesus Barabbas, and then you have Jesus the Christ, and that's son of the Father and the Christ here, and they decide to take the murderer instead of the, the you know, turn the other cheek, Jesus. That is... You're never going to find that. That's not in there. That's not in history. So I, I agree with you that if there was, I like what Dr. Bob said, and he said it really well in a debate back in early 2000. He said, if there was a Jesus, we know nothing of him. We know nothing of certainty of him. He's been lost in the back of the gospel somewhere. And there's just no way to say, you know, we can speculate, but that we don't know of him. Like you're saying, there's probably something there could be. 
but we don't really know anything. And every really. every Christian is going to bring up the eyewitness accounts, which we know that the four Gospels that actually did make it through scrutiny to become included in the Bible, apart from the 16 that didn't make it, right? We know that the four that did are not eyewitness accounts. Right now, we know that one is based on the other. Uh, another one is a, a minor extrapolation of the previous two. And then John just like comes out of left field <laughs> making up a whole new shit that you know, centuries, decades later, and it has nothing to do with the other two, virtually nothing. Right. So none of them were actually penned by the named by the people that were named. I mean, especially not when when it's in the wrong language and the, and the, and the original character who supposedly wrote it was illiterate. But then, you know, Muhammad was illiterate, too. So you, it's amazing what illiterate prophets can write. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, you make good points there. I really like that. I heard there was 90 uh, total of Gospels that we have historically. And I'm not talking like written 300 years ago type Gospels. I'm talking like in antiquity. There's like 94 or 96 total, total Gospels from what I've been told. Um, and like in terms of going back, you know, the Gospel Thomas is these, some of these are getting really close. So it's like, why did they why did they push it out? It, you know, there's so many reasons why this is horseshit. And I really do. I, I like what you bring to the table here because I like doing it. Christians go, well, why do you why do you spend so much time on it? I don't know. Let's say more than half the world is superstitious. And <laughs> I think to the detriment of everyone else, including themselves. Right. Yeah, and then and it's it's difficult to find one historic Jesus who, as I said, was was both uh, Nazarene and Galilean, and and also lived in Egypt at, for whatever period of time, and and also did this, and at the same time did that, and did had the same did the loaves and fishes thing twice, with his his followers being exactly the same amount of 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 impressed and stunned both times. You saw him do it before. Why are you so Why are you so amazed? Why is it exactly the same story when he does it again? <gasps> he did that. You already saw that, right? How is it Jesus was born uh, during the time of Herod, which is before six uh, BC, well, before four BC, and then simultaneously during the, the census of Curious at or after six CE? There's a ten-year window there in which Je Jesus was born both before and after, but couldn't have been born in the middle. And then people say, well, why did, you know, we, we know that Jesus exists because what, what year is it, right? Well, we know that Jesus split time oh between goodness. the beginning of the earth, which they think, I've, I've actually met Christians who think that the earth was created 2000 BC. Not kidding. I mean, we've, we've seen uh, like Mel Brooks used to do the thing about the 2000 year old man going back to the stone age. There was a lot of people believed there's 2000 years before the time of Jesus, and there's 2,000 years after the time of Jesus, and that's how they, it's not even 6,000 years, it's only four. They're not, they're not getting this somehow, I don't, but anyway, but anyway, they say that Jesus split time, and they don't realize that the time that they're talking about would have been the year 45 on the Julian calendar, and that we did not then change the calendar. It was Pope Gregory, centuries and centuries later, who decided to retrofit his own calendar onto the Julian calendar, slight changes to it, but then, then he retrofit the date back to the when he imagined Jesus was born. Now, since he couldn't reconcile 4 BC to 6 CE, he picked arbitrarily a date in the middle to make that the year zero, and there never would have been a year zero, but that would have, he made that, and that would have been the, the Julian calendar day 45, mm. which there was already a Jewish calendar. There's already a Chinese calendar. There's already a, Z a ZD calendar, and they all they retrofit their dates back. So that's what he did. So in I think it was the I can't remember what 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 century he did that, but when when Pope Gregory lived, but he he retrofitted it. And since nobody was it was the Middle Ages, nobody's like really using a calendar anyway. Then except for, you know officials, and he's he's leading the officials, right? So that we that's how we established the calendar. So. One guy arbitrarily set that day, and it wasn't Jesus. You hear that, everybody? <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, I love this, man. Um, I actually have a – I'm about to drop this video, which by the time I drop this show on my channel, the video that I'm talking about is already out. So if you're watching this, you know what I'm talking about. Dr. Bob, I, I just did a Pagan Parallels to Jesus video. I think it was so – wonderfully done because he's not anti-theist okay which you are okay and that's okay you are who you are um 
and Dr. Bob was, just you know, to clarify, just to clarify for anybody that doesn't please. know, anti-theist means that taking out an evaluation, weighing the positives and negatives of religion, we come up that that an anti-theist has come up with the idea that a, that that religion is a net negative against humanity, that it has done more harm than good and should be dispensed with. That I does can't not mean... argue with that. <laughs> then you're an anti-theist. I don't see. Yeah. And I mean, look, that doesn't mean you're like. <laughs> And look, I love uh, watching – I know I want to talk so much stuff with you, man, because you were on the streets talking to the evangelist, and you were, like, not backing down, but you weren't, like, trying to cause a problem. You really want to let him know, like, hey, man, you're not the only one who has a position that you're trying to talk about, and you're going to also hear what I have to say, too. And I, I respect that because – some people need to do that. I think that religion just has the monopoly on the game, and there's got to be some heroes that could stand up and say, listen, you want to believe in fairy tales and Santa Claus and Easter Bunny and stuff? That's great. Go ahead, but don't teach that. Don't make that the mandate. Get it out of the freaking school. Stop forcing people. Let it be a part of history. Hey, we were once... You know, we were once superstitious people, and here's some things we used to believe as humans. But look at us today now that we're advanced. Look at the medicines, et cetera, et cetera. I don't want to rabbit trouble. Dr. Bob. <laughs> oh, no, I, I, got, I, want one I knew I opened I'm, up a can of worms. I'm, I'm sorry. I just have to. Okay. It's not – I want people to understand that it's not that you know, that I want to express what I believe. It's not that I want to compare my beliefs to your beliefs, and you're going right. to listen to what my beliefs are. It's not that. It's I'm doing something far worse than that. Because I'm doing the thing that the believers – the believers don't care what you believe. They believe what they believe. You believe what I believe and well, whatever. We're, we're fine. That's what they want. I'm pointing out they're wrong. You're stating things – it's not just your opinion. You're stating – you're making claims of fact that are not fact, and that already is a lie. But then you're claiming things that we can also prove are not true. And it's enough, by the way. If you, if you assert something to be fact, you had better be able to show that it is a fact. So if you're claiming fact that isn't fact, that's a lie. If you're claiming knowledge you don't actually know, that too is a lie. But then they go worse than that by promoting, you know, their their evidence for the young earth and and all of this, which is you're just lying now. That's all of the creationist arguments. They're just frauds, falsehoods, and fallacies. That's all there is to it. So I'm not expressing my beliefs. I'm telling them they're wrong, and that's what they hate. That now, Doctor Bob. <laughs> yeah, now Doctor Bob. Um... <laughs> Great, great uh, transition. No, I, I love that. I, I respect that. And I'm glad somebody is doing that. So Dr. Bob, Dr. Bob did, did a show with me on pagan parallels to Jesus. And he showed a lot of these parallels, the dying and rising God themes. But we dealt with something I thought you might even like to hear. Um, and I'm sure you do a lot of this anti-apologist work, which is what it's, you know, you're really... You're really defending reality in the best way we can we can test it and see it to be the case with the science we have, et cetera. Um, I've been accused of being an evangelical atheist. Oh, my goodness. Well, <laughs> if that's the worst they can say, I guess that's a good title. Oh, well. But Dr. Bob says that um, when we're looking at the apologists like William Lane Craig and looking at the apologists like Ravi Zacharias, he outright says, con man. He's like uh, – with, with Robbie Zacharias, he's like, he's a con man. This guy is a joke. He's – and I used to be fond of this guy. Like I had spent hundreds and hundreds of dollars on series uh, all, series and all these things he taught, and I was a big fan of his apologist works, and you know he seemed so sincere. And we talked about how they deal with these arguments of pagan parallels. Going back to church fathers, oh, like you mentioned earlier, the devil, you know, knew he went back, he saw, he mimicked Jesus, he knew what Jesus would be, or he saw the preexistent Christ and said, "Let me make mimicked parallel figures and trick people to go for him." And that was one version of church fathers' trickery, to, or uh, apologists. I meant to say that. I'm sorry to get people to think they're right. The other one was that they didn't. Um, that the, I can't remember what he said in the show. He said something about, there's three different versions of apologetics when it came to these parallels that the church fathers had. One of them recognized that they were predating and that they were similar. They, they accepted it. It's almost like at some point that worked against them or one of the church fathers recognized that's probably not the best argument. Let me try and find a better way. And Dr. Bob goes into those things. Do you have any examples that you know of in terms of pagan parallels to jesus that maybe you'd bring to the table 
Well, just the ones that I already mentioned with Dionysus and Prometheus and Alcestis, and and there are a couple of others. That, right. That, 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 but I, but a lot of people will bring up uh, parallels that don't actually exist. I want to pe- warn people that there was a, a book by Kersey Graves of uh, previous crucified saviors. I can't remember what the title of his book was, but I, I don't tend to believe what people tell me just because somebody told me. Right. You know, now I I have bought into uh, a couple of uh, parody things I put up on, on on shared on Facebook stories that have turned out to be parody. You know, that's it's really embarrassing, but it's it's really high. It's like that Poe's Law thing, where it, the religious right is so far extreme that it's it's ridiculous to it, it's difficult to write a parody of them without somebody thinking that that's that that's real. Oh my goodness! Because it, it's such a parody already, right? So as uh, as some have already pointed out, you know, the Onion can just be a regular newspaper now because <laughs> this shit has gotten so crazy. But I don't believe I try not to believe what people tell me just because they told me. I want to verify. I want to be able to look up others. If you tell me, if you give me one news story, and it says something I like, I have gotten into the habit of like looking up the details of that story to see are other news agencies covering this too, you know, different ones, and and are they saying the same thing? You know, and so it's important to do that. It's important to, to the best way, the scientific method of uh, you know establishing what we believe scientifically, which means w- this is what we think is most probably true. Uh, it's not like a make believe, like what believers call it. The reason we're unbelievers because we're not making believe that we're the, the, I, I, when I say I believe something, it means that this is what is most likely true or you know, close to closest to the truth. You try to test your own beliefs wrong, right? Try to disprove your own. So if you want to believe this. Go find out what would disprove it. If other stories are not if are not supporting it, if this is the only news story, it doesn't mean that all of the other news agencies just haven't found out about this, and and only, uh, um, well, what what, what uh, I can't remember. Infowars only Infowars knows this information, right? And somehow <laughs> somehow CNN and MSNBC and and all of these don't know this yet. If that story is only being carried in one place, it's it's not substantiated. It needs to be substantiated before you believe it. Right. Belief belief shouldn't be something that you do before you find the evidence. Belief should be compelled by the evidence. And if there's not, if 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 I have reason to believe that, hey, you know what? Maybe this isn't. Maybe this is not true. It's effectively not true. Well, y- you bring up a good point. This was brought up too. Doctor Bob said you'll love this. Paul says in First Corinthians fifteen that there were 500 who witnessed Jesus after his resurrection, the 12, this and that. Yet, I want to see those uh, those depositions. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, but why is it that if Paul's written before the Gospels and the Gospels don't mention these 500, wouldn't you think the Gospels would have used such a claim to try and put, put their point that, oh, well, listen, he not only appeared to me and the women and this, but also 500. Paul makes that argument in 1 Corinthians 15, but the Gospels leave it out. Why? Something well, for the fishy. same reason. The same reason there was a small town in Mexico 